Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In several of the previous videos, in particular where we talked about the juxtaglomerular apparatus, we mentioned that there was a protein that was released by the kidneys, specifically the juxtaglomerular cells or granular cells, called renin. Okay. And we briefly mentioned something called the RAAS system, and in this video we're going to talk about what that is. So RAA stands for renin angiotensin aldosterone, and then the S is kind of the system there. Okay. And this is a system of renin release which is going to trigger the, the formation of angiotensin II, and then later on uh, the release of a hormone called aldosterone. But we really need to understand how this works. Now let's do a brief review of renin. What were some of the triggers for the release of renin? So whenever we have low blood volume, this is sensed by the juxtaglomerular cells or JG cells or granular cells, all the same thing, of the kidney, and that triggers them to release renin. Okay? So let's think about some things that might drop the blood volume. Okay. And there's really two cases that I want to consider. One's a very minor case, one's a major case. In the minor case, it can be a normal fluctuation in uh, fluid volume throughout the day. For example, if you have a night class, a three or four hour class, and let's say in the middle of class you go and you pee, you lose some fluid there, but you're not drinking any water or anything like that, or Gatorade, you're naturally going to have a little bit of drop in your blood volume because you lost some fluid through urination, you might sweat a little bit, perspiration, you breathe out water, but you're not taking any in. So you might have a little drop in blood volume there. Okay? And that can happen throughout the day, especially if you're not drinking enough fluid. A major loss of fluid volume or blood volume would be if you have a hemorrhage, anything that punctures the body. So for example, if you have a wound from a gunshot, a knife wound, any kind of incision like that where you lose a lot of blood, that would be a severe drop in blood volume. In both of those conditions, you might see release of renin from the JG cells. And the nice thing about the renin release is it's a graded release. What I mean by that is the amount of renin that's actually released is proportional to how much the blood actually loses volume. So for example, you would only have a little bit of renin release from those natural reductions in fluid volume throughout the day, but you would have a lot of renin release whenever you have severe blood loss or fluid loss from anything. Okay? So it's a graded response and that makes it kind of nice. All right, so we just mentioned the stimulus for renin release is low water volume. So as a negative feedback system, we might want to raise the water volume so that we can maintain blood pressure. Remember that low blood volume means low blood pressure. High blood volume means high blood pressure, so they're proportional to one another. So if our blood volume drops, we need to use negative feedback to get that blood volume and therefore blood pressure back up. Homeostasis is the key. So the juxtaglomerular cells of the kidney, that is specifically the afferent arterial, that's where they're located, they're going to release renin. Now, renin is not a hormone. Renin is an enzyme. And let's look at the reaction that this enzyme renin catalyzes. It catalyzes the conversion of this protein called angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. Okay? Now, the key about this specifically the angiotensinogen, is it's an inactive protein and it's always found circulating in your blood. Okay? So it's inactive and we know that because it ends with the suffix ogen okay? or inogen. When we see that it means that we have the inactive form of this protein. Okay? And it is what we call constitutively produced by the liver. Okay, so number one, it's produced by the liver, but it's constitutively produced. When you have something that has constitutive production, that means it's always produced at around the same level. It's not like it turns off sometimes and then turns on other times. It's always being produced, and you would find this protein in your blood right now. But if there's no renin, this protein doesn't do anything because it's inactive. However, when we have low blood volume and the kidneys release renin, Renin converts angiotensinogen into this protein called angiotensin 1. 
Angiotensin I is also inactive. It has to be converted to its active form, angiotensin II, and this is accomplished by the enzyme angiotensin converting enzyme, or ACE, as an abbreviation. Okay? Now, this enzyme ACE is located in the lung endothelium. Okay? So inside the capillaries of the lungs, where gas exchange occurs, there's also this enzyme, angiotensin converting enzyme. So as angiotensin I is circulating throughout the blood, it's eventually going to come to the lungs, where it's going to come in contact with angiotensin converting enzyme. And it will convert angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. Now, angiotensin 2 is active. Okay? It's going to be in the blood, and we consider angiotensin 2 a hormone. Let's talk about the functions of angiotensin 2. Well, since this is all negative feedback, and we're ultimately trying to raise blood volume and blood pressure back up, it would make sense that angiotensin II's functions would involve increasing blood volume and increasing blood pressure. Okay? So let's look at its direct effects. First of all, angiotensin II is a vasoconstrictor, and that's actually how this hormone is named. Angio means blood, and tensin kind of means to contract. So if you contract the smooth muscles inside uh, blood vessels, you get vasoconstriction. And so this actually increases blood pressure. Okay? Another effect of angiotensin II is to increase thirst. So angiotensin II is going to act at the hypothalamus, at the thirst center, and it's actually going to trigger us to become thirsty, so we might want to take a sip of our Gatorade or water. Okay? And if we're drinking water, then that would actually cause our fluid volume or blood volume to go up, right? To get back to a normal level. Also, angiotensin II decreases urine output. If your blood volume is starting to fall, that means your overall water volume is falling. And we don't want to lose any more water through urine. And so one of the ways that we decrease that urine output is by specifically constricting the afferent arteriole of the glomerulus. Remember that the afferent arteriole, no, this isn't the exact uh, slide we want to look at, but here's our glomerulus and here's our afferent arteriole. The glomerulus filters the blood, and if this afferent arteriole is dilated or open too much, then we get a lot of fluid going into here and a lot of filtration and a lot of urine production. So if we want to reduce urine production, we need to reduce filtration at the glomerulus, so constrict the afferent arteriole. And that's one of the effects of angiotensin II. But overall, by doing that, by reducing urine output, and by increasing thirst and direct vasoconstriction, we increase blood volume and increase blood pressure. So those are the direct effects of angiotensin II. Now there's another effect that I haven't put here. Angiotensin II will actually come over here to this gland that sits on top of each kidney called the adrenal gland, okay? or sometimes called the suprarenal gland. Um, and specifically, one region of the adrenal gland called the adrenal cortex has a subregion called the zona glomerulosa. Okay? And angiotensin II is going to act on that region and cause it to release this other hormone called aldosterone. Aldosterone, if you remember back to endocrinology, that was a mineral acorticoid. And aldosterone is also a steroid hormone. But in any case, aldosterone is going to have some other functions as well. Okay? Aldosterone overall triggers water retention. Now, the way this actually works is by acting at the distal convoluted tubule. Okay? Uh, we talked about that in a previous video. I'll kind of just go back here just for a moment. Remember at the distal convoluted tubule back in that video, I mentioned that aldosterone acted and it facilitated sodium reabsorption. But when you reabsorb sodium, water automatically follows that. Okay? So overall, what aldosterone does is it decreases urine output by facilitating sodium reabsorption. And so that way, you actually get water reabsorption with that, and you retain water. Okay? Because we don't need any more water loss, right? Because the stimulus was water loss. It was low blood volume. So get that volume back up. And overall, by decreasing urine output, we increase blood volume and also increase blood pressure back to normal levels. Okay? 
Um, so notice aldosterone really isn't doing anything directly with blood pressure. Aldosterone is really just increasing the blood volume, which therefore increases blood pressure. Angiotensin II does both of those things. It decreases urine output, and it causes direct vasoconstriction. Okay? But aldosterone is really just dealing with the water retention at the distal convoluted tubule. There is one other function of aldosterone, and that is actually to further increase the levels of another hormone in the blood. This is antidiuretic hormone, also called vasopressin. Okay? Remember that antidiuretic hormone was released from the posterior pituitary gland. So aldosterone will circulate in the blood, in addition to doing these other functions, and it will trigger the posterior pituitary gland to release antidiuretic hormone. Now, technically, antidiuretic hormone is not a part of the RAS system, but we're going to briefly talk about it because aldosterone causes its release. So antidiuretic hormone over here is also a direct vasoconstrictor. Um, so it will also cause the vasoconstriction of a lot of um, arterioles um, that ultimately cause blood pressure to be maintained. But also antidiuretic hormone's major function, which is to decrease urine output. Now, while aldosterone acts at the distal convoluted tubules, recall that antidiuretic hormone, in contrast, actually acts at, let me go to the right slide, the collecting ducts. Recall that Antidiuretic hormone causes aquaporins to be inserted into the membranes of these cells, and that actually allows water to be reabsorbed into the blood system. So we retain water. Overall, the entire function of this RAS system is to respond to a reduction in blood volume and blood pressure and to ultimately bring that blood volume back up to normal levels, and then also bring the blood pressure back up. Because if blood pressure is too low, then perfusion to the tissues is also going to be low. Okay? So bear that in mind, and hopefully this video about the RAS system makes sense to you. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.